We are here, gathered together, to talk about how to assist our clients uh, so that, that we can have impact with them when we agree with them, how we're going to support them, and uh, what the outcomes of that support could be, which we can use in the form of a growth plan or sometimes called a development plan. I want to welcome here today uh, our two panelists in the form of Carl Fenter. He's a certified business advisor, been in the business advising field for about 25 years now. Uh, he's from the EPI, as well as Washington Mashanda uh, from Enterprise Room. Um, Washington has also been around the block a bit in corporate and uh, in different ways in management consulting, including in the tobacco, pharmaceutical, fast moving consumer goods, uh, medical technology, and et cetera. And now an enterprise room focusing as an ESD practitioner uh, on the field of small, supporting small businesses and small suppliers. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, maybe Carl and uh, Washington. We also have uh, Tumelo Sochetsi and Lisejo Mokwena in the room with us from, the, from Ibasa. If you guys can switch on your cameras, then we can just do the introductions and get that over and done with. Uh, Washington, if you can switch on your camera. I see we've got the second now signing twice. I think one of them is Tumelo. So um, let's see if we can rename Tumelo to the right one. Tumelo, if you are available, you can also unmute your camera. Um, you to Washington. Um, I see Washington is signing twice. So it doesn't mean that he fell off the webinar as we started off. He was here just now. Uh, Washington. Yeah, okay. Um, it was saying I couldn't, uh, I just, uh, it won't allow me to start the video. Okay, it let's, says let's stop by host. We do that. There we are. Right. <laughs> that we had us worried there for a moment. But uh, welcome, uh, Washington, uh, specifically here today, too. And thanks for making yourself available. Um, I see my, from my side, my picture is now frozen again. So the gremlins are really working against us as look here today. We'll try to sort that out as we go along. Um, but uh, we're focusing on the field of uh, growth plans and uh, how we, when we sign up our clients, can agree with them to have a productive relationship. Now, growth plans and develop, development plans have been around for quite a while, but we hope today to unpack it a bit and to related specifically also to the situation that we're facing right now around the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdowns that we're experiencing and the effect that have, that have on our clients. Uh, real, real topical and important for us as practitioners supporting businesses through these difficult times to make sure that we do that in the best way that we can. It, it, we are facing or refacing difficulty and are about to face more difficulties, at least for the rest of this year, we anticipate even beyond that. Uh, and the way that we support our clients can really make a difference for them. So that's the topic of discussion here today. Uh, we have a full house. We have some people watching on Facebook too. We'll try to refer to you guys too because our room is full. We've got more than 100 people in the room. Um, but let's start off with asking a question quickly. So sorry for those that are on Facebook. You won't be able to participate in the poll, but the rest of us can do so. Uh, we're going to ask you uh, what the size of the businesses are that you are supporting. Um, and you select, 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 sorry, you may select more than one option because you may be select, supporting different sizes of businesses. So, uh, just between me and you, Carl, are you launching it? Shall I launch the, uh, launch it quickly? I'll allow the participants to vote as well as the panelists. So, which of those businesses are you supporting? Uh, Necessity entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, starting new businesses, new businesses run by an owner manager. Remember, you can vote, you can vote, you can vote for more than one if you support more than one category there. Startups that are aiming to grow big in time, uh, micro businesses with less than five employees, small businesses with five to 20 employees, medium sized businesses of 20 to 50 employees, and businesses with more than 50 employees. So it looks like we kind of, as we vote, uh, there's quite a wide representation of different sizes of business that people are supporting. Uh, please vote so. We're going to end the poll soon. Um, great stuff to see voting at the moment. It looks like small businesses with five to 20 employees is the one that's getting the most traction or I mean, most of us are focusing on. 
Well, we'll give it another second or two. If you haven't voted, please remember to click the button at the end to submit your poll. Okay, it's still coming in. Good participation today. We've got about everyone has voted already. One or two still to go. Okay, then I'm going to close the poll now. Right, so um, in fact, it looks like most of us, 83% uh, of us in the room are supporting businesses with five to 20 employees. Remember, you could have voted more than once, so this is not a split. Uh, and then uh, second uh, in line is um, micro businesses with less than five in employees at, at, at 63%. And uh, the new businesses run by an owner manager also scores higher, just below 60%, as is young entrepreneurs. So it's interesting to see that the category that scores the most is five to 20 employees. Um, those are probably businesses that are also hit quite hard by uh, the lockdown and so on because they've got staff commitments and so on. So maybe that is something that we can cover here today too. Let me just share the results with you guys so everyone can see it too. Uh, so yeah, really interesting to see um, what size of businesses are that the uh, practitioners supporting entrepreneurs here today are with us. Uh, Washington, I think this may lead us into the topic with you. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Washington. Good morning. Oh, now we don't hear you. See, so this is this is this hi. Is can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get the gremlins in the system. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. now I hear you. Uh, now yeah. so, thank Perfect. you very much for joining us and for making your time available to share your experience around Code Plan specifically and how we support entrepreneurs. So, um, at Enterprise Room, you are involved in quite a few programs, specifically in enterprise and supply development, where development plans is one of the requirements. So we hope to learn from you around how you use this as a way of making that support relationship a productive one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure. And thank you for inviting us and uh, inviting me specifically and also to the participants that have joined. Um, hopefully we'll be able to share some um, meaningful learnings. Great. So um, Carl's playing a dual role today. He'll be presenting to a bit later on on growth plans, but um, in the meantime, he's running the slides for us in the background. Thanks, Carl. Okay. So over to you, Washington. So you've got some slides to share with us and some insights. Yes, that's uh, that's correct. Yeah, I think anyway, just as a way of introduction, um, my name is Washington Mashanda. I'm uh, with the Enterprise Room. Um, Enterprise Room is a transformation consultancy. Uh, specializing in enterprise uh, supplier and social um, development and we are very passionate about transformation through entrepreneurship and uh, you know we help governments and corporates uh, maximize um, their transformation scorecard and align that to their business um, strategies so you know we have quite privileged to have worked with quite a team and we'll, hopefully i'll run through the presentation that we have uh, that i've put together um, just to set the scene, I think with everybody um, sitting and understanding, I think I think the lockdown, you know, we're in almost week seven of lockdown and the implications of it are varied. But um, according to one survey uh, that was conducted by Sloan on 22, over 55,000 SMMEs in South Africa will not survive. Um, and that invariably means there's close to 42,350 employees that are employed by those SMEs that are set to lose their jobs. Um, clearly, from the lockdown and what we've seen globally, that the, the world has changed, you know, as we know it. And entrepreneurs, uh, the way that entrepreneurs operate will have to change. And SMEs uh, tend to be at the bottom end of the chain. So if you look at, say, the tourism uh, sector, the global tourism as an example, because that was one of the first casualties with airlines being grounded and uh, obviously facilities shutting down. I mean, we've seen the uh, uh, the crisis in the in the cruise ships, you know, where cruise ships were being docked and people had to stay and get uh, and screened. But what you realize is that by uh, there was a domino effect, you know, in global tourism. So travel and uh, the hospitality companies closed down the economic activities. Naturally, SMMEs who are supporting there will take the knock at the bottom. So the impact to the SMMEs is quite important. And therefore, anything and everything that we're going to do going forward 
has to now look at how do you get SMEs back onto track. Now, we basically, I think governments across the world, you know, we from the US to South Africa um, and the rest of the continent, everybody's looking at saying, how do we, uh, you know, put in relief packages? And, and uh, some have gone to historic lengths that even go far beyond what happened during the Great Depression and the 2008 um, financial crisis. But, you know, so SMMEs become, a, uh, they have to, be, they, they should prioritize the resuming and rebuilding and adapting the business models and resuming aligned operations as soon as, uh, uh, as soon as, you know, the lockdown allows them to be able to get in there. And the stakeholders that support SMMEs, be it the funders, be it the corporates, uh, be it government, should focus on facilitating sustainable recovery because temporary relief alone is not going to be enough. You know, there has to be a sustainable recovery. I think in South Africa, when the president uh, was doing the announcement, one of the big things they're trying to push is around how do we make it much easier for SMEs to become regularized and obviously shorten some of these uh, processes in terms of, you know, the registrations and then and, and some of the onerous, um, you know, regulatory hurdles that they have to go past. Now, we then ask ourselves and say, so how will that happen? So at an, at a micro level, you know, through well-developed and fit-for-purpose growth plans. Now, growth plan, as we all know, it outlines um, how your SMME can get from where they are today to where they want to be to, uh, in the future. Now, pre-COVID, that would have been a, you know, you might have developed a plan, which COVID, very few businesses, if any, may have affected COVID into the picture. Now that COVID has come in, you now have a new status point of what we call today. And you have to look at now revisiting whether you have that plan or you're developing a new plan in terms of where do you want uh, to go. Now, in all those, you know, skills and experience may hinder SMME's ability to create deliberate and effective growth plans, uh, in addition to running into the common mental barriers such as the cost, you know, and, you know, are there opportunities? Why should I spend time in this? And therefore, impactful growth plans become more and more relevant uh, than ever before. Okay. Um, so that's how um, we can go to the next slide. Okay. So when we talk about the uh, path to growth. Now, it's one way to just mention that there are growth plans, you know, and, um, you know, a growth plan is as good as, you know, what is put in there. Now, the important thing that we've put is that you have the business advisor and you have the SMME. Now, one of the key things that always comes in there is it depends. So as a business advisor, generally, and uh, more specific in the South African environment, you have been appointed or have become part, you, you were brought in as part of a package, whether it's an enterprise uh, supplier development program, and therefore there is a corporate um, who is paying for your services. So you have a very interesting uh, setup where you've got the business advisor appointed by the corporate to say, I am embarking on this journey to develop as part of the transformation journey, these SMMEs, and I want you to work the journey with them. Now, and I'm sure a lot of you, you know, will probably point to the challenges that you may face when you're engaging, um, you know, with the SME. Some, there is resistance because they feel, well, I just got the money and let me run off and do it. Some, there is a demand because they want you to help them. So you always get these various balances. But however, it's going to be important because your mandate is with the corporate. Now, how do you build and bridge that relationship that you're going to go forward? All right. Now, what you want to do is with a lot of it is that there's going to be options in terms of understanding what is growth because when we talk growth it's very relative you know and you know you need to now understand so you need to understand your customer's business and i've put down a couple of uh, parts you know in terms of growth on the how and we can look at you know you could grow by just getting more customers and I think that is one of the biggest things that SMMEs are always looking for. We're looking, they're looking for the market. You know, um, we can give as much training, we can give all these other programs, but at the end of the day, like any other business, we are looking for a market. But, you know, I need to be able to invoice because that's how I can uh, conduct business, you know, get my business, you know, get the revenues that I need. And that's the whole purpose of going into business. So therefore, 
when I raise that, we're looking at you want to get more customers. Now, get, getting more customers as a path and as a growth idea is you staying in the existing market with the existing product range and finding more customers for these products. So if you are selling 10 items, you're probably looking to double that. Um, you know, and this path, you probably focus intensively on marketing, advertising, as well as thinking about different pricing strategies to reach more people. Now, as a business advisor, you need to understand that and be able to say, so, you know, if this is the path that we want to work with, what is it that we need to do and what are the implications of, uh, of what we have to do? Right. Another path that you could look at from a growth perspective, and by the way, it's these these parts are not mutually exclusive. You know, you, there could be a combination um, of options that you take up as you develop this plan, uh, this this growth plan. They could get more money from existing customers. You know, although finding new customers is a simple concept, it is hard to do in practice, and it's also worth exploring how to make more money from existing customers. Now, be it, uh, you know, this could be positioning of the product. You know, uh, what is your price positioning versus your competitors? You might have gone in trying to undercut the market, but you may have room, you know, uh, in, in, within which to increase uh, prices or, you know, add, you know, make segmentation of that particular product as well, right? So that is another path. Now, if, you, if you're gonna pursue that, then at least you are clear in terms of what it is that you need to do going forward you can look at a path of offering new products and services, okay? Which is another way to simply grow uh, and offer more stuff, you know, whether it's complementary products or incremental products that may, uh, that, may, that may actually come in into that space. And we'll talk a bit more as we go along. You can look to enter new markets. Um, now, entering new markets is quite interesting is that this could be domestic market, it could be a regional market, it could also be an international market. I mean, with COVID, what COVID has taught us now is that, you know, the way of global trade, you know, e-commerce is just, you know, shown as that, you know, it's a way of reaching. So imagine if you're a business that was still able to conduct business. I mean, Amazon, as, as an example, was actually on a hiring spree because of the surge in demand for their, um, for their, for, 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 for their goods and services, right? Now, if you're entering, uh, if you're currently operating in only in your home country, the business could grow quickly by expanding internationally, assuming that your product is appropriate for shipping across borders. So you've got to do your research, understand, you know, can I go and sell this product? So, you know, you can't just rock up in Botswana or in Swaziland or Zimbabwe or Zambia, and you want to try and sell um, your product. You need to also do some understanding of uh, the local. And I always use a classical example of um, the peanut butter, um, you know, and uh, I guess maybe I mustn't mention the name because then I might be eating. But you had a peanut butter brand that went across into the market. And by the very nature of the name, the, the product was not moving simply because people associated that name, you know, with uh, something else in other countries. So you got to do your research in that space. But also, if your products are already available internationally, you can make more effort to reach new markets, either by translating the content into new languages or investing in uh, true internationalization of your website. How do you get the reach beyond your own uh, country? You can open new distribution channels. You know, that's another channel. Now, and, and, and I'm talking to you as the business advisor, when you put yourself in the shoes and you're discussing with your client, we need to grow. Now, how do you grow? Because don't forget that in your pursuit of growth, your competitors are also looking to grow and those that have the market share are looking to defend it. So you are actually trying to come up with a plan that is going to allow you to get it. In some cases, there might be an untapped market, but in a lot of cases, it might actually be that there's displacement that's going to happen. Why would someone now you choose to buy your product versus the other product that exists? So this, um, so opening new distribution channel is about expanding ways in which you reach people. And I think COVID again has brought that to the open, you know, if your product was traditionally only available in store um, and in specific stores, for instance, and now those stores had to shut down, you have a problem. And you could see the classic uh, challenges if you walked into the shops, you know, your spas and your pick and pay and all the other retail stores that were operating throughout. Certain products just ran out. I mean, a good example was honey. You know, you just walked in there and you could not find honey anyway. Um, and clearly because there were other issues that had come in, but that's an important part of looking at it. Maybe I can, can I reach new, new um, reach the people using new different channels? Um, and 
the next one, another growth channel that we look at is you could actually look at buying other businesses. Now, that is, you know, if you have the cash available or you've got access to the cash that's available. And that may be an option um, that might actually become your rocket fuel to growth, you know. And when done right, an acquisition of another business can advance along some of the other parts to growth in the fraction of time. So when you're buying, what are you buying? Are you buying a complementary business? Am I buying a business that's going to enhance, you know, my product or bring something else to the table? And yes, for a small business, that might sound weird that, you know, they're looking to buy, but actually that opportunity may exist um, and you need to look at it. And they, because in fact, in any case right now, there is, going to be there is going to be casualties as we've mentioned. And some of those operations that may not recover from post COVID, may not necessarily just be a shell business. You know, there might be a business that actually sits there and the owner for one reason or another may not be able to resume, but what is it that you can do to take on that business and move forward? So it, it, it is not a far-fetched uh, opportunity. It's not left just for the big corporates. You can also look at new partners and uh, new partners as a path might be where they complement, you know, you are now bringing in, uh, you know, other skills or they bring something to the table that you ordinarily did not have. Now, that's always a tough, if you have been, it's, it's always a tough option if you've been used uh, as a business owner, you are used to sitting there and making all the decisions yourself. By bringing on new partners, you bring on new, new challenges and new expectations that need uh, to happen in there. So if cash flow is low, consider partnering. Again, you could partner with a small, large, upcoming or even declining enterprise who offers complementary services to yours. Um, these services can let, you, can let you go off to focus on your core competences. Um, you know, you can look at having products um, sold in retail stores or in, or in other companies' websites or by other affiliates. So again, you're looking at those strategic alliances that you can uh, feed upon. Okay, next move. Right, now having done that and having identified the paths, now you as a business advisor, it is important that you understand your client because at the end of the day, your role is not just to draft this plan. And I think one of the key, uh, um, key requirements or key expectations is that there has to be ownership of the plan that you're going to develop. If you find yourself writing the plan and just handing it over to the client, and you know, it's just going to be a report that just gets shelved on the side, or they have no idea what it is that you're expecting them to do. So there has to be that joint involvement and the understanding of why we need to do this. And there is a buy-in from the parties. Now, where is the business coming from? So to do the roadmap, now you're, you want to understand where is the business coming from? So which parts or part, which path or parts do you recommend? Now, in order for you to be able to recommend, there is a key part for you to also understand the business yourself. You know, you have to spend time and understand that business and be able to give a recommendation that is going to be deliverable. It's a tangible and it's also something that the, the, the SME can understand. And to start making that regime, you need to be clear. Um, so you just one second. You need to be clear the picture of where the SME is right now. Now, you know, and that is going to concern. Now with COVID having come in and the lockdown, the question becomes how many of the business advisors have been able to continue to be in touch with the SMEs that they are supporting? And that is a challenge that even we at Enterprise Room have to, had to spend time trying to figure out how do we connect, you know, are they reachable on cell phone? Are they able to reach us on Zoom? And I think all businesses have had to relook at how, I mean, webinars have become the order of the day because you realize you need to be able to reach out and continue to reach out and, con and con communicate with your, um, with your SMMEs. Now, in trying to understand that, there are some key questions that I believe you, know, you need to ask. And in this interaction that you're having, be it a new customer or a new, a new, a new SMME, or you've been working with them, you know, what's the company's strengths and weaknesses? Because as much as I've outlaid the parts um, that one could pursue, and there's different, and there's many other parts, and there's different options that one could come up with. But you need to now understand what is the company's strengths and weaknesses, because those are going to become key to whether whatever it is that you're recommending, they can actually move on and execute. Um, what are the sort of risks faced in their industry, you know, and or 
what are threats to their business model now risk in the industry are they in a regulated industry if they're in a regulated industry you know you can't try and then get more money from the customers because your product uh, price point is regulated um, i mean fuel is a is a good example it's more, more more particularly petrol you know there is a regulated price at which you can sell it for so now if you want to get more money from customers it's definitely not going to be on fuel but maybe you can look at efficiencies um you know down the 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 the, the, the value chain now what are some of the risks faced in the industry or the threats that we've spoken about? And what are the main opportunities? I believe there's always going to be opportunities. And if we look at the COVID environment now, as much as it creates or brings to us the challenges that SMEs are facing, it's also putting together opportunities. Um, on a personal note, I'm a firm believer that the future of the continent and South Africa, as well as the world, is going to be li lies actually in SMEs. And that's where we need to be developing. The big businesses, some are not as agile and they're not able to actually adapt. I mean, a good example is SAA. Of course, it had its own challenges as it came in, but COVID just became the rubber stamp. You know, you shut down the entire travel industry and they're not able to, to, to move on. Right. Then key part is also understanding the business because in all those parts that we're looking at, they have implications. And one of the key ones is how much funding is available be it within the business itself or access to, um, you know, what can they access, you know, in terms of the funding, because that can also tell you whether the plan you're putting together is going to be achievable or not. Then next, you need to ask, where is it going? Right. You need to have, you need to get a big picture of where they want to go. And that is your role as the, as the business advisor. And, you know, a couple of key questions. What's important to the SMME? You know, what is it that they aspire for? What is it that they visualize? What are their business values? You know, you need to have that conversation and understand because as you come through to recommending, you also need to understand that there's also interpersonal um, uh, factors that come into play here. Do they have a passion for doing one particular thing well or do they want a more diverse business? You know, understand those. And a good example is if you take uh, the Spaza shop model, you know, yes, spaza shop, small business, but there's a lot of smaller businesses that are looking to either become multiple owners, you know, of spaza shops. You know, it's not just restricted to the one. That could be a view that they have and a vision that they have. And how do you then support them in that space? Do they want to grow as quickly as possible or do they want to focus on slow and sustainable growth? What are their pressure points? What, you know, what is that sweet spot that would look at it? Because as you put together a growth plan, it, it's going to have to take into account those expectations. It shouldn't be, this is what the business advisor expects me to do, but this is what we want to do. And that ownership, taking ownership of those things is very important, right? Now you're picking a path or paths, right? You've, you've, as you've built through the uh, development, you're not starting to pick a path and you are recommending to say, look, which one would work? And then you return to the different paths from the previous slide that I spoke to with this new information about the business in mind. And you can recommend to say, look, I think this is the best path that we need to go for. Now, already at that point, you've been able to say, you understand the options that the business has by understanding the capabilities of that business and any limitations or challenges that exist for that particular business. You now can get something that you put together, which we should have the impact that is required. And, you know, I mean, otherwise, you know, a year down the road, everyone just thinks, well, the, the, this thing does not work, right? So if a business is worried about existing business model coming under threat from technical, uh, technological changes, then the option could be to plan to develop um, uh, new products. If on the other hand, the business does not, uh, does one thing well and can see it continuing to do that for the foreseeable uh, future, then perhaps staying focused on that one particular product and maximizing the number of customers it reaches is the best path. I think at the end of it all, all I'm saying is that there is never going to be a one size fits all. You know, you can't just take a template and just put it there and run off and say, well, you know, just add and change the name and, and Mr. Mr. SMME, this is your new business, uh, this is your new growth plan that you're gonna go because it worked for the one party, there's no, there's no guarantee that it's gonna work for your other SMME. So you need to be adaptable, right? Now, having done, you can draw the best plan in the world. You can come up with all the best uh, options that exist, but there is a key part to it, which is always going to be execution. 
I mean, a great strategy with great everything, even in the corporate, in the big corporates, is of no value unless it can be executed. So question is, is your plan that you've put together executable? You know, can it be executable? Have you broken it down? Now, we can speak about having picked a general growth path to follow. It's time to now become more detailed. So the execution should become detailed. You know, we can choose one overall goal, but you're now breaking it down into specific items and objectives with clear deadlines, because that's how it becomes measurable as well. You know, you'll be able to follow through, you know, and document how you measure success. What is success? Uh, you know, you got to define what success looks like. Is success that we want to have more customers or we want to be more profitable, you know, or we want to have more branches that are opened, define those documents, define those outcomes, because that's what you as and the SME can agree on. And with the deadlines, you're able to manage and at least push and have that, have that, those deliverables um, uh, executed or delivered. Um, a good example is if decision is to offer more products as the path to growth, decide on what those products will be, right? Take one product to, to add and consider how long will it take to develop it? It's one thing to say, I'm going to develop a new product, but how long is it gonna take you to get there? What about, um, what about market research and testing? You just don't wanna rush and, and, and push to launch your product. If I may interrupt you while I talk about the example. So let's save the example for uh, the Q&A discussion where we can maybe contextualize it based yeah. on the situation we faced with now in terms of COVID-19. But thank you very much. Perfect. I think what you created for us here is a really good uh, framework in terms of understanding a growth plan as a roadmap that's agreed between a supporter and the small business. And that that agreement is the basis of what a growth plan should reflect. It's not just kind of a, a report, a consultant's report to a small business, but it contains the input of the small business too. Um, I, I specifically liked your comment about being deliberate, you know, sort of um, uh, not making assumptions. And of course, in this time where a lot of things are uncertain, uh, we, we are forced to actually make assumptions. So there's a bit of a gray area perhaps that we're entering here in terms of the, 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 the knowns um, and the scenarios. In fact, yesterday I was involved in a scenario planning um, exercise yesterday morning. Um, and what is clear is that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic um, is going to be with us, even in the, the better scenarios, the impact is still significant. So for us to be able to support our, our clients in addressing that, of course, is important. So let's hold the thought of examples and come back to uh, that in the, in the Q&A side just now. Um, but uh, following on that, I think, you know, sort of let's, let's just hear from you guys in the room. So whether you're on Facebook, you can type in the text chat there or in the messaging there. And uh, if you're on the live webinar in Zoom, you can use the text chat to answer this for us. You know, sort of let's talk about um, uh, how you currently initiate relationships with your clients. So we heard now about growth plans and mapping out that process from Washington. How do you currently initiate a new relationship with a small business client when you start off? Just type in the text chat when you start a new relationship with a client. And then uh, uh, perhaps Carol, you can put up the slide for us. I think we've got a slide with those questions on. Um, how do you uh, use the text chat to, to type? How do you start a relationship with your client? That agreement that Washington spoke about in concluding to uh, coming to a roadmap. And then also, what do you currently do to agree up front on how your support will be organized? Let us see some some ideas. You know, we, so some of us have been in the field. I know I know people in the room. When you sign up a new client, how do you? I don't, I don't see any. Uh, uh, maybe it's a thought for you to to ponder on it for a moment. How do you? How do you currently initiate a new relationship, and then how do you come with an agreement with that client? How do you make sure that it's not just a piece of advice from your that you're driving it, but that you actually include the context of the of the owner manager or the client and that in fact that that client will own the plan in the end so i see alec is saying i use the web facebook and whatsapp video calls to connect with people at first that also says um, i have a number of face-to-face -face chats with possible new clients so first 
creating rapport with a person. So that relationship, of course, is also important. So it's not just a uh, mechanical engagement, creating rapport with the client. Uh, Diane says via our initial consultation and a written coaching agreement signed by both. Okay, so there's kind of like documentation of what this expectations are that we are going to be deliver on and uh, making sure that we're on the same page in that regard. Um, uh, please add more ideas there, but I think let's proceed so long, um, Carl, if you don't mind. And by the way, uh, I've got, Albert, we've got your question. Muraka, we've got your question. We'll come to them just now. If you do have a question, just click on the, on the Q&A button and you can post your question there. Otherwise, we use the text chat for this ongoing conversation. So, um, Carl, if we can go over to you. So, uh, drawing up a growth plan, you know, sort of, so Washington frame with us, what are those things that we may want to include and the approach to follow. Um, a lot of us are sharing still here. Uh, Matthew is saying more important is possible to face face to face chat, identifying current needs. Of course, when we say face to face nowadays, we may include it being online, you know, the faces may be separated by screens. Um, yeah, those are the realities of the new of the new now. So, um, Carl, you've, you've worked with many clients, have now also with COVID-19 encountered some challenges that needs to be faced when you agree with them. What is the support that you're going to give and how do you write that up into a kind of an agreement? I could say it's not only a roadmap, it's kind of an agreement between you as the practitioner supporting them and uh, the client whose benefit lies in the business growing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Christoph. Yeah, I think um, uh, this um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a great opportunity to, to, to look at, at the reality and the challenges. I'm uh, uh, naturally looking at uh, what can business advisors do. That's, that's our first thing. And um, and uh, I, uh, I, I think uh, um, I'm not going to stand still too much at the growth plan uh, content per se. I think uh, uh, Washington has shared great uh, information with us um, regarding uh, what should be in there, the, or finding the paths for growth, setting up that roadmap, and then importantly um, uh, executing the plan. Um, what we're looking at is more maybe a framework for advisors um, when we uh, start to create impactful uh, growth plans for clients, that it's a facilitated uh, process and we've created uh, basically a framework. And I'm not going to spend time to, to go through it in detail. Um, uh, as I say already, uh, um, Washington has already spent some time on this, but I, I think what I do want to share is to say that there are four sort of uh, elements and they're almost a cycle in themselves also. It's not necessarily a uh, step one, step two, step three. Uh, some of the things might happen in parallel, but four dimensions of that framework that we need to look at as business advisors. The first is understanding what are the key success factors in the business and what is driving the business, what's making it successful. Uh, then uh, Washington has uh, touched on doing your SWAT, understanding uh, what are the opportunities, even in this dynamic uh, environment, what is happening, where are opportunities opening up, where are uh, things closing down. Um, he's referred to tourism, uh, which is a very interesting phenomenon that uh, where always the tourism was aimed at the older people who's got uh, retirement money to spend. Now, all of a sudden, in COVID and post-COVID, they move to young people because young people say, well, I'd rather live my life now and enjoy it. Uh, I don't know <laughs> where I'm, how long am I going to have to, to do that. And while well, the older people now uh, can't move around. So, so that's the dynamics that you need to be aware of in your market and your sources and so on. And then um, uh, I think one of the things is that process of planning just to say, don't plan too far ahead, make it short, incremental improvements, um, uh, test something so that learning cycle, make it very short and quickly, test something, learn whether it works, adapts it, 
And, uh, and then lastly, what you were touching on is meeting the growth plan expectation. That's that whole contracting and, and, and ownership and role clarification with the owner and the people to make sure, listen, um, I'm a facilitator of this process. This can't be, and I, Washington also referred to that. And you've got to do that right from the start, so that the client understands, I'm only facilitating this. If, if they don't have ownership of this content of what is coming out of this, they're not going to implement it. So we're not writing a 30 pages business plan, we are facilitating a, a roadmap. And that's, I think, very, very important. What I thought the best way to sh uh, share this in this content is maybe quickly sharing with you guys um, uh, a bit of a case study of a client that I engaged um, uh, about two, two and a half years ago. And um, and what is uh, this is a normal, a normal small business, and I can give many examples like this, but uh, this is a very nice one um, because they went sort of through all the phases of COVID and everything. Now, um, this is a business that was established in 1997, selling art material and uh, uh, presenting art classes through various art teachers. And, and then my friend uh, Pierre, that you see there in the picture, he and his art teacher, after retirement, he started to take art classes, and then he and his art teacher bought this business about two and a half years ago on a 50-50 basis. At that stage, they had about two full-time employees and 10 part-time uh, employees who are teachers, and roughly 120 st students. And then uh, about 18 months ago, he then also bought out his partner and, um, uh, uh, and, and move on from there. Now, what is interesting about this business is, uh, I think from the word go, uh, when we engaged and we went through the strategy process, is that they understood that they had a bigger purpose than making money. So their mission was to create a friendly and safe space where creatives could belong, grow, and empower others. And that, uh, that was also the vision that they wanted to create, and that's the space that they want to create, and that naturally that goes into the culture of everything. Um, and, and they're doing this uh, classes for beginners, intermediates, advanced, all mediums. They use various specialists as teachers and even workshops. And then, as you can see at the bottom of those uh, four pictures, they then exhibit the students' uh, art in, in uh, the library and uh, things like that. So that was what they were doing already as part of their culture. Then about 2011, 2012, they went onto Facebook and they started to engage social media um, where they uh, sort of advertising class and workshops and sharing their students art so they started to create something on a very basic and uh, we're talking about eight years ago um, and uh, even started to expand that um, sharing even how-to videos online and and uh, and so on so so that was their their process and then we we engaged um and, and looked at, uh, you know, the normal analysis, what is in working in the business, who are the customers, um, and so on. So, uh, uh, but the first thing that we did that year in terms, if we go back to that model, was looking at the entrepreneurs, the partners. And we said, okay, who are you? What is it that you as individuals want to achieve? And how do you want to achieve this through this vehicle, this business? And um, and I know next next month we are uh, talking about um, the uh, um, understanding myself uh, better to support my clients better, um, where you will go more in detail, or, or we will go more in detail this. But what we did here is we used the energy profile just to profile. The, the the three partners in in this business and how they work together now that creates a very nice uh, discussion point because people say oh yes i can recognize this in you and i can besides starting to know themselves they, they it, it it creates a framework for discussion 
and that enabled us uh, in the planning process to understand also easier each one's contribution in energy that they bring and so on. So naturally we did the normal analysis of the business, of efficiencies, where they can improve and so on. And then we uh, created uh, um, an action plan from that strategy. In other words, what do we need to do? Prioritize monthly targets with a dashboard. And what was nice about this experience for me that every week that we went back for the next session, they already implemented what we discussed the previous week. So it's very, uh, you know, very action orientated. And, um, and the other thing that was, and that's why I'm sharing this case study, is this is creative people. So uh, the culture of a creative space is non-judging. In other words, it's much easier to experiment and fail and try again and learn again. And I think that is part of what made them also move easier forward, easier in, in this whole space. Um, and then in 2019, uh, um, when Pierre took over, uh, he actually included all his personnel in the st strategy sessions, which, which brought in even the teachers who are um, sort of uh, part-time um, personnel. And, and, and that created a space for more creative solutions. And I think that created the basis of the capacity to respond to COVID-19. Um, and yeah, and just, just as, uh, as things started to go well, then this happened to them like everybody else. But you can see what they did here when they were shut down by uh, COVID-19 they were immediately responding, okay, how can we engage our clients? They already built the community. They understood the principle of community. And then they created this thing of how do you feel? Send us, send us a, a piece of art that expresses how you feel. And they shared that on their Facebook. And they started to do that um, through all kinds of things. And then... Uh, oh, so, so, yes. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, but so that's yeah. quite a thing because you were working with them you had kind of a growth plan in place we and already have a plan on, absolutely the whole upper cart was turned around so yeah how do we respond to that now because we've got a plan and that yeah. plan was kind of working it was succeeding they were making money they were growing i, I, I think that they were they were growing um uh, and they were starting to making money filling, filling up the classes more effectively um but what was interesting is the move to uh, one of the biggest challenges that, uh, that we had in the, in, in the business was the cost of premises. The rent, it's almost impossible for the business to get the relationship right of income versus rent out of that premises. So they had to uh, think beyond, uh, beyond that. Um, and we so, started so, to look so at how can they do business outside so, the premises, which includes I, I online. Get, yes. get from you. So, so what we're talking here is the relationship between you as the practitioner, the service provider, the, yeah. the advisor, and the client. So you use the word we, that includes you as the service provider. You Absolutely. say that. Yeah, yeah. I decided yeah, that, yeah. You know, that includes yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You're part of that process. Uh, part of the process all the time. Yeah, I, I, and, and um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's, it's by, uh, relationship based. If you don't have that kind of relationship, then you're just a consultant. And you go in, you give them something, and you walk away. But if you want to be an advisor, um, I think you need to have that trust relationship. And, uh, and, and, and um, uh, there's a part ownership in that, in that process yeah. also. So now COVID-19 happened, and uh, the plan was kind of under threat, or the whole business became under threat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 then all of a sudden, um, the uh, the things that didn't work in the previous experience, like trying to sell things online, were not really successful. But all of a sudden, um, they uh, were starting to. Um, uh, try new things. So naturally they couldn't have classes, so people, they can't ask people to pay. 
So what they did then um, is say, okay, let's experiment with one class. Let's take one of experienced teachers, do an online class, see how it works, tweak it, and, and they did that. And, and the first class that they did then uh, um, uh, generated students from all over the world. So, all so this of wasn't started, in the growth plan. They didn't have this in the growth plan. To that do was, this was not in the growth plan. The growth plan was how can we uh, do online sales of stock, but classes was not originally part of the growth plan online, um, uh, which naturally is now part of the plan because those classes, those growth, those, those students, especially the new students, can remain there even if the others can come back to class, physical class at a later stage. So that's a, I, I think that's an important thing. So they adapted the, the, the current plan. And at this stage, actually, uh, after they tested this one, currently 60% of their normal uh, adult uh, students are attending online classes. And they've now started with one uh, of the children's classes also testing that. Because we know there's a heavy load on the children with the online schooling and da, 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 all those kind of things. So, so that is the big thing. Uh, the interesting thing on the retail side, what happened here, is, is that the students still come and now pick up their materials. And, and the students make 50%, up 50% of their retail sales and they could open under the stationary uh, label. Um, but what is interesting is which what they couldn't get right previously. Now with the change, the shift in market and the reality, they are growing their online sales, and that is basically all new clients. So um, that is how the change in market and circumstances has actually created a, a, a market um, that previously they they just couldn't successfully leverage, and uh, and I think um, uh, as you I say, I how that came about because there was online stuff in their plan, and they, so you 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 sat down with them and you developed a growth plan and saying okay we need to go into online a bit more. They didn't really work. So, but what they did eventually after lockdown was not in the plan. How did that come about? How did you how did you work with them in in shifting? Because I think this is what we as yeah are sitting with now all of us are sitting with now is how do we so we can't say let's go back to the old plan there must be a new plan yeah yeah and i, I, I well the, the important thing is what they what they did is 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 is, is look at uh, literally on a daily and weekly basis uh because naturally i i mean all all, all the people with small business clients will know um you've seen the slide They've been approved in level five for stationary, and then a week later the police shut them down again, and and so on. So it's on and off, on and off. You're not sure what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. So it's literally day by day to say, okay, but what can we try? Uh, we we know, um, uh, and I I think what is important is is Washington referred to that. Is you, you've got to understand the shift that's happening in the market, as as I said earlier, for instance, in the tourism market. Now people, they didn't uh, want to buy online because they wanted to go in, touch the papers, test the, whatever. Now they couldn't do it. It's not that accessible. So all of a sudden they are online and therefore they buy online. Um, naturally, they have special, special uh, discounts now, COVID related, as you see, 20% off and things like that. So there's incentives. Um, and and having a delivery service for for those online sales and all those kind of things uh um so i but i think this is kind of excellent to take a case study and kind of learn from that so you've got views you, you think they can do that but they don't necessarily think that so how do you navigate that so that it's their plan and exploring this new idea so there was online but it wasn't what they're doing in the yeah. In, 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 in prompting them to think outside of the box to come up with new ways and if we can take it maybe beyond this specific case study you know sort of yeah, yeah. how can we as business advisors help our clients to just think wider and maybe there's some small little thing already in their plan that can now lead them into something new uh, yeah so, so uh, part of the process that we established even pro, uh, pre-COVID-19 was going through the process of what can we so we we say this is the reality now snapshot this is where we are now 
this is where we want it to be. So there's a gap. We, 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 we've not completely, in terms of outcomes, moved from A to B. So then we use sort of that stoplight kind of thing. What which should we start to do new? What should we stop on? What is working? What should we continue? And once you've created that kind of, of, of culture and way of thinking, uh, with an uh, easy to reference dashboard that they can easily look and say, okay, where are we against where we want it to be in terms of outcomes? What is working? What is not working? That's the one thing. And I think the other thing is to create that culture of prioritizing. Don't try a hundred things. Prioritize what you want to achieve. Uh, try one or two things. Test it. Learn fast. If it doesn't work, and 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 they've 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 done this and we've experienced this already in the pre-COVID where they've tested uh, uh, um, uh, 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 soap and, and kins, uh, you know, wine, wine and art and music and art evenings and uh, having their workshops in a restaurant rather than in the studio and things like that. So they kept on experimenting all the time. And once you have that culture in the business, that makes it much easier to... Um, to uh, uh, pro proceed from that. Um, so you still use the processes, but inculcate those processes as part of the operating culture of the business. So okay, it's so sort I of- that, I hope that, that advice lands well. So I just wanted to underline that that uh, point, uh, Carl, for everyone on the webinar here today, is, is perhaps it's for us also to find our own way in doing that, you know, sort of. Yeah. Um, but thank, thanks for sharing that. Um, um, so, but you do have a few few concluding remarks that you want to make. Uh, yeah, uh, so just to uh, conclude with that, I, I think, um, and, and we've attended uh, a, a coaching session um, once at CBA uh, previously, where the facilitator say, said, um, uh, if you're a coach, you should work yourself out of a job. Um, if you need to see the client more than twice, you've not done your work. So there's a little bit of truth that in that, I think, in this process also. I think often we are too afraid to empower the client with solutions because we're afraid then they don't need us anymore. Um, I, I find the reverse. The more that I enable the client, the more they trust me to come back regularly and ask, but can we have another session? What do you think about this? So that just, just as, as this. Yeah, I think just concluding in terms of the key business success factors, Understanding COVID-19, we deal with the whole person. Uh, uh, we do it always, but now even more than uh, ever. I, I, I've read something there where the writer said, you know, uh, we're not talking about somebody who lost, uh, lost a job or uh, people are living, their, their total existence changed. And people handle that differently. So again, it comes back to how well do you know and understand your client? Um, understand the moves in the market. I've already um, uh, referred to tourism, you know, looking at integration, diversification. Can you expand the business? Uh, Washington um, referred to buying new businesses. In this case, the client is actually looking currently at buying a complementary business. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, then um, the shorter term planning in terms of the, the assessments, test, fail, learn quicker, cycle. Um, do the incremental planning if you so that continuous planning, incremental improvements and changes. But it's important you can't do that if you don't have measuring and uh, evaluation in in place. Yeah, I mean if you can't measure what is happening, you're just blind. So you, you have to have your systems in place. And then lastly, I think very very important if the owner uh, of the business, if the entrepreneur doesn't take ownership of the process. Um, you're wasting your time, you know, and then you're just doing it uh, for the money, not, not for impact. So you need to clarify expectations, roles and responsibilities uh, as you go along. And they might need to new, uh, learn new skills. I, you know, I've, I've spent time assisting people in this time, learning them, teaching them basic stuff, how to create a appointment and outlook. Um, how to manage a, a basic meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting, or two people on Zoom. Basic stuff that we need to maybe assist our clients uh, often of if we don't know, you know, link them with somebody who knows. So um, definitely part of this is learning new skills. And what I hear you say is during this test, these testing times, it's perhaps important to check in with our clients more often than not because things change so rapidly. And it, there's Absolutely. a bit of a, it's not only kind of 
kind of clinical business support is a bit of an emotional connection needed and so on too. Absolutely. Okay. So you, you, yeah. I know that you're doing a course on growth plans soon. So can you just share with us there what your that is about? Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, just shortly um, uh, doing a, a course on growth plans with Tsiba Business School, a short course, um, uh, and, and it's basically um, uh, actually going to be two courses. The, 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 uh, the one uh, is linked to what we're talking about today, the growth plan, and we'll work from that framework. And we can sh uh, share maybe the link um, uh, to the to the brochure on the chat. And the other one is actually that effective support of entrepreneurs, so understanding yourself and your client and how to help them, uh, which is also going to be a little bit the next uh, uh, about what um, will be happening in the in the next um, uh, episode of the webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, online courses about uh, two and a half, uh, three hours online, uh, once a week with two consultations, very practical. The students got to go and test and implement with their clients. So it's very practical with uh, assignments that they've got to do. Um, yeah, so we, we, we really believe that uh, uh, this could be very helpful for all business support practitioners. Uh, that needs to guide their clients now and going forward. Okay, and uh, people can indicate there on the poll if they're interested in that. You, you've got a special offer. Uh, there's a special offer. So the normal price is at 2,450. Currently, there's uh, basically 30, over 30% 30 800 Rand discount. Uh, for doing the course, uh, any of the courses now, so it's 1650 um, if you register now. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, it will be interesting to see. Um, we know in this time uh, cash flow is difficult, and, 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 uh, but it is now time to invest uh, in yourself. Um, and uh, it will be interesting to see what um, how people will respond um, in investing in their own development in supporting their clients. So uh, thanks, Christoph. That's, um, I think, for now for me. Uh, th uh, thanks, Carlos. I'll keep that open if people want to indicate the interest or not. Mui um, uh, uh, asked, uh, Carl, why is it that you keep talking about the client at that and so on, that you have no role in that? And maybe Washington, if you if you can switch on your camera too, then we can bring you to the discussion now too. Um, so Washington, if you can, I'll I'll send you a request to yeah. start your video. I, I, Carl, you can go for that uh, on such so long. Uh, why is it that you talk about the client side of this and that? What was your role in this? Uh, okay, all right. The client, well, he, he, the client have to decide. The client have to take ownership. I'm only only a facilitator. So I facilitate the process, I might prompt the client, but in the end, uh, if you want your client to take ownership and implement, as a business advisor, I can't implement. I, uh, Washington referred to this as execution. <laughs> so uh, that's a very strong word. Uh, if you go wrong, uh, uh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so... Uh, and that's important. The client must execute. You can't execute as a business advisor. So if the client doesn't make the decision, I believe, and and they don't take ownership of the plan and the content of the plan, um, you just uh, in a sense wasting time. I I believe. Yeah, so that... well, as well, I think I think what Carl has, has done also in his presentation is he's presented it in the language which he is using with that client. I'm not. I want to put words in your mouth, Carl, but. Uh, in a language that he's using with his client um, to ensure that that ownership is happening. Yep. So even when Carl tells the story, I, I think uh, he tells the story in that language which empowers the client to own it, even if he's got a much more active role than what the story actually tells. So I'm not sure if that's correct, Carl. Uh, ab absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, the, 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 the the language and the discussion and the words is a, and the direction is a little bit different 
uh, when you just deal with the owner as when you have the workshop with all the personnel. Um, but even the planning of those processes, I mean, you do with the owner because in the end, you want to empower and build up the entrepreneur to be successful. Yeah. I'm only successful if they're successful. Uh, that, that's it. Uh, uh, Washington, does that resonate with, with your experience too? So even in ESD programs where you work with uh, clients that are identified by a corporate that you work with, that, that ownership of the, of the plan is not that of yours or of the, of the benefactor, the, the company that the, these uh, clients are, are suppliers to. Yeah, that's actually true. I think what uh, Carol is saying is uh, very relevant. And I think the biggest challenge is always around, you know, you, there's, a, there's a talk about personalities. You know, you get some beneficiaries who take this with both hands and run off with it and want to benefit from it. But at times you come across beneficiaries who feel they are entitled to this, um, you know, just the money part and everything else, you know, you're wasting my time. You know, I don't have time for you. So there's that, that, that dynamic is always difficult and you need to be able to bridge, you know, you know and understand what you're dealing with. Yeah, uh, so Christoph, I think uh, while, while Washington is talking, I realize, I mean, naturally my case study is an example of an independent businessman that, that's building his business. So, yeah. I mean, they also applied for some uh, UIF support and, and, th and they, they got basically nothing. Um, so what they're doing, they, they have to make it work. Uh, I think your challenge is in the space where you are operating, where you are have beneficiaries that are subsidized or even, uh, you know, getting all the, all the support for free uh, getting that mindset right, even for the entrepreneur, makes it even more important. I, yeah, I yeah. don't, I, fortunately, in this, in this kind of example that I used, I don't have that challenge. I mean, this is, this is an entrepreneur who wants to go and he, he, he does what he wants to do and I can either assist or not. But um, I think when you work with people in, in, a, in a support scheme, it's very important for them to un make them understand that they've got to take the ownership. It's not a, uh, not the corporate, not the government. Nobody else can make their business successful, <laughs> only themselves. <laughs> yeah, I see uh, uh, Christoph's uh, screen is um, fr frozen again. Um, so I think we're already quarter two. So at this stage, I think maybe what we should do. Uh, uh, do you have last remarks at this stage? Um, Washington, that we uh, um, might uh, yeah. want to close off before okay. we move on to the Ibasa section, and we can yeah, maybe uh, also, yeah. Sure. Thanks, thanks. I think I think for me, it's uh, you know, it's uh, everything and all this is always about uh, adaptability. You know, how adaptable are you? And I can uh, almost wrap up that I think, you know, the one last thing that we can look at is you need to be able to teach your SMEs to plan and always keep planning. Uh, I mean, growth plans need to change as often as the world does, and that's all the time. And I think the COVID, you know, none of us would have affected this scenario, you know, unless you work for militaries and stuff, you know, who look at all these potential threats to the world. <laughs> you know, yeah. most of us would not have had that. And I think we've, we've, we've hammered on the point about the ownership, you know, uh, and understanding why they need to be doing this. And there has to be a value to it, you know, because sure, you know, the primary push at this point, like you're talking about the entrepreneurs, is they are trying to survive and they're trying yeah. to get, uh, keep their heads above the water. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be about, you know, understand who you, your, your entrepreneur and build that relationship. You should essentially, as a business advisor, be the go-to person when they want to get um, clarification or want to work on something. You know, if it's, if it's one of appointments get cancelled because, you know, I don't feel that you, then you, you probably are not adding value. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, uh, very, very, and, and that, that's what made this uh, case study or the example uh, that I used here very, for me, very relevant because the natural culture, so as an example, you can almost use as a benchmark and say, but the natural culture in a creative business 
is that quick, uh, non-threatening, experiencing, trying uh, new things and so on. So, and I think the fact that they're already a, a planning culture and a sharing and exploring culture made that easier for them to adapt to the crisis. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have that in your cult, in your small business now, uh, start there. Create that culture quickly, as soon as possible, and work from there. Um, yep. So thank you. Uh, I, I want to can uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Lesehu again to start her video, and this, I don't know if she might want to make a comment there, and then we can go over to uh, the Ibasa segment. Um, Washington, from my side, uh, thank you very much. It's been a privilege uh, sharing this uh, platform with you. And we hope to uh, talk definitely forward again uh, going forward. Um, uh, this is such a wide and deep topic. I mean, you can have long discussions <laughs> about this. Um, so yeah. all, all the best also with what you're doing. Thank you very much. Hi, um, yeah. Thank you for joining. Um, uh, yeah, if you maybe have a, a last comments on that, and um, uh, then I will maybe just uh, in the end share the Ibasa slide at the back uh, when people want potentially want to join. We've totally lost um, uh, Christoph, so um, yeah, let's uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, definitely a powerful conversation and one that should be ongoing, be it on our Facebook platform, um, as well as our many other social media platforms. What I just want to point out is some of the comments that have been shared. I believe it's important because the purpose of this webinar um, is to share with the public not only to empower business advisors, but entrepreneurs and to grow the ecosystem, to be more agile, to be more flexible, to succeed in these tough times. One of the comments from Valhalla, one of our members, um, pointed that for a successful growth plan, you must plot the process with the client, sign confidentiality of non-disclosure, then conduct a company diagnostic to assess what is versus what is not. This will be the starting point towards assisting clients in setting up their growth plan strategy. I believe that comment should also address a question raised by one of our attendees, which said, how do you as a business advisor advise ethically? So I hope that feedback assists in you as a business advisor, advising ethically different clients who may have similar or different products. Another case is when you look at the virtual environment we are in, how would you conduct a growth plan in a virtual environment? This is where more accountability needs to be well defined and well understood. In the virtual environment, how you set up your targets, how you make sure that you check your targets has been reached must be on consensus. But most importantly, there must be real discussions on the consequences of not complying with targets. We've heard of business advisors in our community, IBASA members setting up different platforms on social media. Others have been WhatsApp groups. Others have gone to online platforms like the ones that we have to ensure that business advising can still continue. So a growth plan in this lockdown is still possible. Whether you're going to do it for large, a large enterprise or a small enterprise, it really doesn't stop the discussion. The issue is agility. The issue is flexibility in setting those targets. Um, in a nutshell, this is really what the platform is for. It's an Ibasa platform that we have come up with as a webinar series to address the need in the ecosystem. And I am very happy that one of our members, Carol Fenn, a certified business advisor, raised the issue of how to encourage a growth plan in the arts and culture environment. The perception that arts and culture can be airy-fairy is very sometimes misdirected, but it is important to see that even in that sector, growth plans can be set up as well as fundamental um, objectives can be obtained. So IBASA is passionate about all of those things. And I think that is why when we are moving over to discuss what IBASA is doing in the ecosystem, it's just to share that about two days ago, we were actually on SABC News. It was the IBASA chairman, Dumelo Zodetsi, speaking on the stress that the SME sector is under and what 
viable options are there. There are discussions of loans that have been availed to businesses in general, as well as some form of reprieves that can be negotiated. What we are saying as IFASA is we must take advantage of all the support that is out there, whether in the form of grants, whether in the form of loans, whether in the form of renegotiated agreements. This is definitely the time to relook and review most of the agreements and the understandings that you may have with clients or potential suppliers within your control. While we're discussing a growth plan in a season when there's so much uncertainty, it's to re-emphasize the importance of having a good business advisor who will allow you to keep focused on how to get out of a situation irrespective of the environment that you may find in. But we must say, these are not going to be easy times. And one must be willing to relearn old habits and pick up new habits. And we are hoping that this webinar platform will provide that opportunity. In a nutshell, if you would like to know more about Ibasa, we are more than happy to share that you can find us on our website. We are available online um, during this lockdown. Unfortunately, we are not available on telephone as our office is still currently closed. We are currently supporting our government in implementing reasonable levels of lockdown. We will respond at least within 24 hours to emails. So definitely if there's anything that you may need, we will be able to get back to you. If you want to become an IBASA member, that is also an easy process. You can simply send an email to admin at ibasa.org.za. Please fill in the application form. It is a very reasonable fee of 600 Rand, once off only, and include the supporting documents such as your CV, certified, um, certified ID, copies of your certificates and degree. We definitely look forward to knowing how we can assist you. We have an exciting pro bono program that we set up at the start of lockdown, whereby we are asking business advisors to come register themselves to avail an opportunity to assist an enterprise, entrepreneur, or any business that is in duress. We are doing our part to ensure that our ecosystem is able to make it out of COVID-19. We are still active in advocating that SMEs be prioritized as part of key supply chains in certain sectors. So do look out for what we are doing in terms of communication that we send out on our newsletter and occasionally on our website. We believe that we will come out of this a better society we will come out of this terrible time looking at our businesses even more to make sure that we are able to meet new opportunities with the same enthusiasm before the lockdown. On our side, we look forward to having you at every webinar that we host. And over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks. I must apologize on behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Internet. <laughs> and I've got no idea why I was thrown out so badly. I could not get back into the room, but eventually I made it. Um, so thanks for carrying it, and, and, and I must is, is, is I can't emphasize it more than you have, but I'll, I'll do it in any case. Uh, become a Barca member if you're not. It distinguishes you from everyone else there in the field that's pretending to be a, a professional practitioner. Uh, there's an assessment process, uh, you grade it, uh, your clients know that an independent party has uh, endorsed you, and uh, you're part of the community. So this webinar is for free for everyone, but um, if you become a member, there's more uh, value that you can gain from that, as well as the standing that you have with your, with your clients. Um, and then there is that service that Ibasa is currently offering for businesses in distress. So if anyone can put up their hand to uh, offer some uh, additional help in time that you may now have available, uh, just register there on the Ibasa website for offering that, um, free uh, support to some of the struggling small businesses in our communities. So thank you for joining us, guys. Next month, we will be here again. Uh, the topic is understanding myself to best support my small business clients. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, looking inside 
about who I am so that I can show up with my clients and support them best and also understanding them and their perspective, their traits and how I engage with them as a, as a practitioner. So thanks for joining us. Carl in Washington, again, thank you very much for your presentations. I see we still have full hours. So, um, you know, indication that what was offered here today was a value for 